What's up, YouTube? Ooh, you guys see my foot? So let's get right into it. Today, what we're going to talk about is your guitar tracking is sloppy, and I want to make it better. I want to make it perfect, and you don't know, but you can do that. All right, first things first. You need some new strings, okay? In my testing results, one pack of strings is good for three songs, and then the strings start to die out. This is especially true on bass. Bass strings die out faster than guitar strings. So if you're gonna skimp on one of them, don't skimp on the bass. Uh, you can change strings every song if you want, but if you're gonna do one over the other, change strings every song on bass and not on guitar, which I know sucks because bass strings are expensive. So after you got the new guitar strings on, make sure that you stretch them and you can hold at different notes on the fretboard and stretch like this. Don't, don't pull too hard, you know. You don't want to break it, but the strings are capable of stretching quite a bit. And then after you do that to each string a little bit, play them for a minute, really strum into them and just play hard and then stretch them again until you can tune it and play it for a second and it doesn't fall out of tune, which shouldn't be more than five minutes. Do not overplay them or else you're gonna deaden them too much. So I'd say five minutes max. So most of these concepts apply to a DI box. This is a reamp box. A band is borrowing mine right now. But one like this. Up it there. So you can get a good DI signal from most interfaces, but there's more variables in um, setting the gain and making sure that the noise floor is where it's supposed to be. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. The point is, there's more variables to go wrong when you plug direct into an interface. The safe bet is to use a good quality DI box. And to that end, I would say that there's a reason that professional studios use a DI box rather than going directly into an interface. Now, if you're using a real mic'd up amp or like a Kemper or an Axe FX or another modeler like that, you can still use these tricks to get perfect takes. Okay, what we're doing here is we're setting the level for the input gain. And what's important here is that you're strumming hard. Um, a good thing to check is palm muted chugs. So you can do that. So let's get into it. Okay, so you can see I've got my session here. And the first thing you want to do is drag in your stems or instrumental track. As you can see, I've got it here. And then once you've done that, um, you need to make sure that you set the correct tempo. So for me, this song is at 115, so I've got it set at 115 now. But if you drag the front, the, the beginning point, generally things should line up. Almost, but for some reason it's still a little off. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag this one point right over to there so that everything is on time. Enable the click. Let's listen to it. So you can hear that's on time. It has a little fill coming into it, but the beat starts here on 18. Okay, so now we're gonna create uh, our tracks that we're gonna track the actual guitar on. And I'm gonna create four of them, okay? So you want four tracks. Uh, set them to input one, create. Okay, so there'll be four blank tracks. And this is what we're gonna name them, okay? We're gonna go guitar L, guitar, oop. Guitar R for right, guitar C for center, and guitar tracking, which is the one that we will be tracking all of this on. Go ahead and hit, put tracking and the center to pan to the center, and then these have already been panned out for me. I don't know why, but thank you, Logic, I guess. And so we're going to enable the record option on guitar tracking here. And basically the concept that we're doing here is we're recording everything on this one track and then after we record it we're going to slide those up to these corresponding tracks so that way you don't have to record over a certain part you can punch in parts move them wherever you need it just makes everything a lot better and you'll see why when it comes to how I track things so to make sure that you don't have a bunch of lag while you're playing um, it's important to set your buffer size as low as your computer can handle. So like right now mine's set at 128. Um, 
You could set it at 64 and that'd be even better. The lowest is 32, but I doubt that you're going to be able to get away with that. So 64 I can get away with, 128 I feel fine playing to. If you're really hating the lag and it's just destroying you, what you can do is off the DI box there is a split that splits the signal and it stays quarter inch and you can run that into an amp or an Axe FX or a modeler and use that strictly for monitoring yourself while you're recording so that there's no lag. But when you go back into your DAW, you're going to hear whatever plugin you have on your DI track. You're not going to hear the tone from that amp or that modeler. You're just recording the actual raw DI signal. So an important thing to do is to set your channel over here and to make sure that it's set to mic and not instrument. Um, when you're plugging directly into your interface, you use the instrument in, but you have to use mic gain when you're using a DI box. What you're going to do is you need to set your input gain level without a plug-in on, okay? What you're going to aim for is like around negative six, so you'll see when I play right now, it's pretty low, and you want to strum hard. One of the good things to do is to try palm muting. Palm muting is a good way, but at least make sure that you're strumming hard. And you can see I'm hitting like negative 24, so I'm going to go to my gain and I'm going to gain it up. Okay, you can see I'm hitting like negative 3, I'm going to back it off a little bit, maybe to negative 16. Up a little bit, maybe like 18 or 19. There we go. Perfect, so now it's like tickling negative six, that's right where we want it. And then go ahead and uh, load up whatever plugin you want to for your guitar tone. Cool. There's no real discernible lag, I'm able to record to it, it's fine. As soon as you start adding plugins, like on the stereo output, then you start introducing lag. So leave this as pure as possible, and that's why it's good to bring in stems or an instrumental and to record to those, rather than trying to record to a full mix. But if you do record to a full mix, do it on a track with no plugins and disable the master plugins that you have. But whatever's on your master channel, your guitar is still running through that. So you gotta basically take any plugins out of the chain that your guitar is going to run through to come out of the speakers. So if you're using a guitar with EMG pickups, which I have one but the other actually isn't, but if you are or any other active guitar, uh, it has a battery in the back which you probably know about, a 9 volt battery, and that battery is good for about 3,000 hours. So basically before you go to record your actual guitar tracks, just switch out that battery just to play it safe. Tuning is a huge thing, okay? You can really hear on a recording when a guitar is just slightly out of tune. So you really got to be um, particular about this and make sure that you really listen for that wavering sound when you hit a chord. Um, my greatest way of, of checking is just doing like a bar chord like this. And a lot of times, when something's out of tune, I'll knock this out of tune. You hear how that wavers? You don't want that. And so, a lot of times, what I'll see uh, guitarists do is they'll tune their 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 low their lowest tune string, their bottom string. They'll tune it too sharp. And I think it's because you have to tune this string a little bit lower than the other ones. Uh, and I would say that I always tune it slightly flat because when you strum, your hand is striking that string first. So it's going to bend that string the most out of all of the strings. So the other ones might sound fine, but it really is about that initial strum. So when you're, when you're tuning, make sure that you're strumming every few seconds. And make sure you're checking the tuner after each strum. So to sum it all up, tune your bottom string slightly lower than the rest of the strings. And then check 
to make sure that your cords and everything don't have that wavering nasty sound. I've lost my pit. Pickles, where have you gone? Pickles! So now what's important is you need to listen. You've got a guitar cable going into a DI box, and then out of the DI box is an XLR cable going into the interface. The interface and the DI box are likely going to be fine. If something sounds weird, it's going to be either the XLR is bad, or it's going to be the instrument cable is bad. So if something sounds off, this is where you need to catch it. You need to swap out the XLR now, or you need to swap out the instrument cable right now, and see if that's an issue. Alright, so for this first riff, um, I'm going to start before the drums start, okay? And the important thing here is, uh, if you try to record this riff just to the metronome, your timing's probably going to be a little bit off. So the best thing to do in this case is to either copy that se the next section of drums and just paste it there um, for you to record over temporarily, or to program a little simple drum part just for you to keep time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the section of drums that follows and I'm going to put it over that section. So first things first here, uh, I think there's a little drum fill coming in. Okay, so first things first here, I think there's a little drum fill coming in. So the beat starts right here. I'm just going to grab this first little section of it, actually this first section here, and edit that in. Make sure we get that in the right spot. Okay. And we're going to record to that. Here we go. Ow! My toe! <laughs> cool, so I got the intro riff. Uh, let me edit it and put it in the correct place now. So first things first, I'm going to delete this drum take, this drum part that I just added here, okay? Because we know that that's not actually there. It's actually here is this drum fill. And we should be good because I felt pretty confident in that take. I'm going to drag it up to the correct spot and let's look, hear how that sounds. Cool. Sounds good to me. Um, you can see I cut off a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit of my strum, but I was pretty, oh, no, I didn't actually. Pretty on time. Okay, cool. That was essentially the intro to the riff, but now I'm recording the actual meat of the riff. Okay, so, you don't need to record all the repetitions, and yes, that part was a little sloppy. I'll get to it. I'll get, I'll get to it, okay? All right, so what we're going to do first, we're just going to slide this guy up here because other than the, the picky part, it was pretty solid. We're going to double check that, okay? Because if we want one left and one right, like recordings are, we need two takes of that. Okay, don't worry about quad tracking. You don't need to do that. Okay, cool. So I've got both those guitars tracked now. Um, I just need to punch in this one part that kind of sucks. Here we go. Alright, so let's try punching it in real quick. I just wrote it, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to play it super solid right now. But, I know a way that I can. And I'm going to show you. So what we're going to do is we're going to mute the uh, guitars here for a second. And we're going to track this at uh, half speed, actually. And you could record note by note. And there are certain cases where you might want to do that. But usually, if you record a riff at half speed, it's essentially the same thing, but quicker because you're just getting the other notes done in succession. And it's usually just quicker. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Here we go. So the riff is normally. As you can see, I can't play it very good right now. Half speed, though. Much better, right? But there's still something that we can do to make it even cleaner. 
I'm only playing these top four strings. While I'm playing these, these low three strings tend to ring out a little bit or something. So you get some scotch tape, okay? Scotch tape because it's easiest on the strings. You can use other tape, but I think scotch works the best. And I'm just going to tape it around the 12th fret. It doesn't matter too much where you do it. I'm pulling them up a little as I'm doing this. And then I'm taping it to the back right there. And I'm taping them up and out of the way because all I'm playing are these four strings. Alright, but I'm still going to track a half speed so that we can get it extra perfect. For these half speed sections and everything, you don't need to play in or out of it. What you need to do is make sure that the sections before and after you play into whatever part you're playing half speed. So basically, you just need to make sure that you transition not the half speed part, but the part before that or after it. Okay, on the other side. And now we're going to edit these. So this is the whole section here. These are quarter notes. You cut it right here. That's one note. If I was to cut it right here, that'd be two notes. Okay, so we can cut at the individual note right here and you can go and cut each one but there's a shortcut with logic I don't know about with other programs place the cursor over here and then get the scissors tool and if you hold option you'll see a little plus sign come up and then you can click and it will cut each one of them on the uh, at, at, at the same length so <clears throat> we can uh, make those half as long because we know that we uh, did it half half the speed. Make sure and then go into shuffle. And then we're gonna go like this. And drag them over. Make sure everything's lining up on the grid right. It is. Yay, that's all of them. Let's listen to it real quick. Hey, that sounds right. Um, to get rid of some pops and stuff, we're gonna go over to this crossfade. And I'm going to add one. It doesn't matter what kind of crossfade, really. Just add one. Just a length of one because that way it just gets rid of that little pop. That sounds clean. Uh, we're going to scoot this back to where it needs to be. And let's listen to it real quick. Make sure to set it back to overlap. And don't leave it on shuffle. We're going to copy and paste the riff. So let's grab the whole thing, copy it, paste it, where it needs to go, and let's listen to how it transitions here. Okay, it might be a little sudden. So all we're going to do is play that transition. We're going to take our tape off, we're going to play that last little pull-off thing. And that's all I'm going to focus on, it's just playing. I'm kind of missing that last note, huh? So in that case, you know what I would do? I would keep this transitionary part, okay? I'm going to bring back those other notes, actually, which are going to be right here and right here. I'm going to do the same thing with this track. And then make those all the same length. And then we're going to make those half as long again. Uh, we don't need this first note. We can get rid of that. Um, let's make sure that these are on the grid. Yes, they are. Okay. Now all I'm going to do is scoot these into place. Okay, we don't need to do anything crazy here. Just going to go like that. And go like this. We're going to crossfade them like we did with the other ones. We'll go one. P, 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 there we go. Now they're crossfaded. Now let's see how that sounds. So that way it has the actual strum from me pulling off and then strumming, but it still has that clean note. And you can play with that. You know, you can drag this back a little bit. All right, let's listen to the whole thing.
All right, that about wraps it up. Uh, I hope you learned something today. If you like this video, give it a like. Uh, subscribe to my channel and hit the little bell so you can tell when I get a new video out. That was a lot of words. Bye-bye.